Hi, I'm Aaron, Assistant Head of Brand at Camper King, and today we're going to give you a full camper van handover. So we're going to start off looking under the bonnet at the vehicle itself, um, and just very quickly to show a few elements of this that you may need to know. Um, we've got, first off, your dipstick for oil, just in here. You've got your water fill cap, should you need to top up screen wash. And you've also got your coolant just here. All three of these, um, if required, need filling, will come up on your dashboard. Or if picked up by a service or one of our service team, um, something that may need to be attended to at such a time. With your new Volkswagen, it will come as standard with a three year manufacturer warranty from the date of first registration. And with that, it will come with Volkswagen Assist, which is a comprehensive breakdown cover, which will stay with you for as, as long as your warranty lasts. All of the relevant contact information for Volkswagen Assist is found inside your owner's manual. So we're now behind the wheel of your new camper van, and we're just going to talk you through some of the uh, very basic controls on the new T6.1, which is very similar to, to previous models. Um, to start off with, on the right-hand side, uh, next to my right knee, we have the light switch, which can be set to auto, you can set low beam, and you can also pull the switch out altogether and turn on and off your fog lights. Um, typically, when they arrive to us, they're set on auto, and that's what most people tend to keep them on. On the steering wheel itself, the 6.1s have got a multifunctional steering wheel. So on here you can control volume for your stereo, you can change um, channels and select different tracks when you're listening to music. Um, and on this particular one with cruise control, you select speed for cruise, um, cancel and set and, and what have you. You've also got on here a voice command, so um, by selecting that you can give instructions to the multimedia system to call people off your phone if your phone's synced via Bluetooth or change tracks it again if you've synced up your music as well. Um, behind the steering wheel you've got the two stems or two stalks. One on the left will do your high beam, low beam and indicators and the one on the right will do your windscreen wipers speed and you can adjust all of that and that does front, rear um, and also water from your spray bottle as well to clear your, your front screen. Next to your gear stick in the main section of your dash here you've got uh, fan speeds for your aircon you've got temperature and then you've got direction of where the air is dispersed in the front so in any vehicle that was manufactured after t6 they'll have a diesel particulate filter um, and basically what that what that does is it takes particles out of the diesel to make it meet fuel emissions and fuel economy um, what can happen from time to time is that that particulate filter can build up particles um, and it does need a good long drive for a good long run for it to burn off and clear those particles um, and it just means that your engine itself is managed as best as, best as it possibly can be. Um, if it is required that that needs to happen it will come up on your dashboard um, in an amber warning light, it's nothing to worry about, it's perfectly normal in these vehicles. Um, and as I say, Volkswagen would recommend that you take it on a long drive, uh, say you know, 40, 50 miles at a steady, steady speed, um, and it will naturally burn off any of those particles that are built up over time. So, around the back of the van is where your vehicle spare wheel is kept. Um, and that's located just underneath the bottom um, in a cradle which you access via two bolts on the underside here, should you need to. And that will have a standard 16 inch steel wheel in there. Um, in order to take any wheels off and put them back on, you'll need your van jack, which is located in this red bag in here, along with any relevant wheel locking nuts.
Hi, my name's Simon from Camper King, and today we're going to show you how to change your wheel. Um, first off, what we'd like to do is try and ensure that the vehicle is on a flat level surface uh, and have your vehicle in park, in gear and with the handbrake on. So firstly, what we're going to do is we're going to go to the vehicle and get the jack. This should be located uh, in your double seat or under your single passenger seat. Should be in a red bag like so and we will empty out the contents and show you what's in there. So contents of your jack bag, there'll be a few small tools for helping you remove um, wheel bolt covers. There's a little screwdriver that's in there, a wrench and a towing eye cover and the jack itself. Um, so first of all, what we're gonna do is we're going to pop on some gloves, if you have them, um, to keep our hands clean. Then we can go over to the vehicle and we'll start removing um, the covers for the wheel bolts. So first off, we'll remove the covers from the wheel bolts themselves. You will notice that we should find a locking wheel nut key, which is just located there. Um, and we'll retrieve the key itself from the jack bag. So we're gonna get the locking wheel nut, pop that into place and start to just loosen off the wheel bolts by half a turn. Next off, we're gonna to go to the rear of the vehicle and loosen off the spare wheel carrier. So what we're gonna do is we're going to remove the bolts from the spare wheel carrier. One of the bolts will stay in place as it allows you to slide the carrier over to drop the wheel down. Uh, so let's go loosen those off. Anti-clockwise to release the bolts and this will start to drop the wheel carrier down. Um, be careful of hands being in the way in case the carrier uh, does decide to drop. With one of the bolts removed on the driver's side, we can now lower the spare wheel cradle, which will allow us to remove the spare wheel itself. Uh, what you might need to do, depending on how flat the wheel is, is uh, move the one bolt back in slightly to allow you to remove the spare wheel itself. And now what we'll do is pop this round to the side of the van where the flat is and just put it underneath the vehicle whilst we're jacking it. With the spare wheel removed, uh, we're now just gonna pop it underneath the vehicle when the vehicle's high enough just to act as a bit of support should anything happen. Uh, so what we're gonna do is release the jack. Underneath the vehicle, there'll be a cutout in the under trays which allow you to pop the jack onto a support brace underneath. Uh, and then we can raise the vehicle. With the jack now in place, what we can do is start to raise it, and when we get to an appropriate height, we can pop the spare wheel uh, just underneath the sill should the vehicle drop for any reason. With the jack now raised, what we can do is ensure that there is clearance underneath the tyre so that we can start to remove the wheel bolts and pop the spare wheel on. Now that the vehicle is raised, we can start to remove the wheel bolts to pop the spare wheel on. As you may remember, we previously loosened these so it'll make it easier to take the bolts out. One thing to add, if you do have um, aftermarket wheels, you may need to use different wheel bolts to secure the spare to the van. Lastly, we're gonna remove the lock and wheel nut now. Uh, removing it last just makes it easier to take the final bolt out 
What you might have to do is give the wheel a slight tap, so just make sure that everything is away from the vehicle, just in case anything does happen. That's it, one wheel removed. What we can now do is take the spare out and pop this into place at the back of the vehicle. What you can do is just use one hand, just hold it in place so that you can line up the bolts. Tighten these by hand first. So what we're going to do is just nip these up now slightly whilst the van is still in the air. Because we've got the parking brake on, this just allows the wheel to stay in its place uh, and allows us to tighten the bolts. What we're then going to do is just lower the jack down just so the tyre is touching the floor uh, and then we'll tighten the wheel bolts up again as tight as we can. Now that the tyre is just touching the floor but still supported by the jack, we can just nip the wheel bolts up as tight as we can. Now that they're tight, we can fully remove the jack. Now with the jack removed, what we can do once again is just check the wheel bolts for tightness. And that is how you change a wheel. What we're gonna do now is pop the spare back underneath the vehicle uh, and that is everything complete. So we're now gonna take a look in the conversion and living area itself. Um, to start off with, whenever I get to where I'm going, I'll spin the front seats to begin with. Um, and we've done a video on our Camper King guides which will explain that in a bit more detail. Um, worthwhile mentioning, plastics either side of the swivel bases, because it is such a snug fit, they do tend to scuff over time. This is something that's perfectly normal and not something that you should worry about. So today we're going to look at spinning your double swivel seat, um, discuss some best practice tips and make it as easy as possible for you. So have a look at your double swivel seat. You'll notice you've got two pins at the front and two pins at the back. So to start with, we're just going to undo those all of the way. You'll notice before you get to the top, there's two little notches. And you want to get those and move them out of, way, out of the way of these two grooves here. And it just stops when you're moving the base round, those falling back in and snagging you from spinning the seat all the way round. Same here, two little notches and move those out the way of these groove holes here. Exactly the same at the back. So undo them all the way, move the little notches out the way of the grooves, and that is just about ready for us to start spinning round. Cool, so at this point, depending on where you've parked the van, um, and providing you can do so, you wanna put the van in gear, and then we're gonna slowly drop the handbrake. So it will rock slightly until it's completely off, and that basically just stops the swivel base 
scratching against your handbrake causing any potential damage and also it makes sure that with the van being in gear if you accidentally knock a handbrake you're not going to go anywhere so at this point from the back push the seat away from you towards the dashboard the back will always go towards your driver seat and you can slowly start to spin clockwise whilst keeping the seat pushed towards the dashboard as much as you can It'll freely come round you can then just align your double swivel seat and then we need to secure all four of the bolts so if you do them up loosely to begin with so that will do for the back and we'll go round to the front and do the same just do them up loosely so that they're all in position and then when they're all in you can tighten it off as much as you can that's that one sorted and then the two at the back and the last one there you go that is your double swivel seat fastened in reverse it is exactly the same so do it slightly quicker this time undo all four pins all four bolts make sure that the little notches are out of the way the grooves two at the front And then we're going to jump in from the back again push the seat away from you towards the dash and this time we're going to spin anti-clockwise nice and gentle no yanking and pulling and just realign and do them back up like so key thing is not to yank and pull make sure that you've put the handbrake down at the vehicles in gear so that you don't get snagged on anything and just make sure that you're always pushing towards the dash and as long as you do that it makes it 10 times easier so we're going to talk you through your main living area um, in the back of your van so you've got as you'll see lots of different cupboards um, for storage which are operated by these push buttons to release and push in to, to lock sometimes uh, these can get stuck and if they do You'll just need to pull the push button out to release it and allow you to open and close the cupboard. Sometimes it might be worthwhile putting some WD-40 or some other lubrication there to, to stop that happening as often. So to start off with, we've got your sink and your hobs. We're going to look at the sink first and how to operate the tap. Starting off point is turning on your water pump. And to do that, up on your power management system, just make sure that your water pump amber light is pushed on like so once we've done that head over to the sink you can just then lift your tap and it will pump your water through nice and easy next to that you've got your two individual burner hobs we've already got some gas connected and to turn these on like a barbecue you've got a, a dial at the top here and a knob so just push it in twist it anti-clockwise and just use the ignition to light it like so and then to adjust the flame just twist the dial around dependent on uh, how hot or cold you want something and then to turn it back off just push and twist it round all the way clockwise until the zero is back facing 12 o'clock below that we've got your grill and to use the grill it's exactly the same again we've got the dial and knob on the side here and ignition here with the grill very important to make sure that you pull your heat guard out at the top 
just to ensure that you don't split any of the edging, which will normally happen if you don't do that, just because of the heat rising from the grill. So exactly the same again, push in, twist, and ignite like so. And again, just adjust the, the flame using the dial. And again, to turn that back off, push in, twist it around anti-clockwise, and just ensure the dot is horizontal facing the off. The last thing we're gonna have a look at is your fridge. So you'll notice at the top of your fridge here, you've got a little catch that we're just gonna pull up to allow us to open it. And when we open the door, we've got two notches on the top of it, and one of them can be used as a vent. So if we push that pin in, whenever you're not using the fridge, it just keeps a small gap to allow some air to circulate and just stops any bad smells building up in the, in the fridge. So we're just gonna open that. Um, You've got a light on the inside, you've got a rack here, section here for, for bottles and what have you. Um, and the top section here is your freezer, which just opens like so. The on and off for this is the dial up here. Now this works off ambient temperature, so dependent on what the, the temperature is outside the van, you adjust the temperature accordingly. To turn it on, you'll feel a click twist it round and you can just adjust that to however high or low you want this and if you have it on the maximum setting that will work the freezing compartment at the top um, and obviously with that will drain your battery a lot quicker if you've got it on the maximum setting all of the time to turn it back off twist it back round and again you'll feel a click and that's your fridge freezer turn back off. So we're now going to have a look at your water tank which is located inside the vehicle itself and we do that for a couple of reasons um, mainly just to avoid frost uh, causing any damage to the, the tank and also the electric pump system itself. So in this rear cupboard here um, you've got quite a nice bit of storage but under there is an observation hatch which can be taken out and you've got a false shelf here which covers your tank and also the water pump. So should you need to gain access to it, you can do that from the inside of your, your van. Um, in terms of keeping these clean, we'd normally recommend to say once a season, use, um, you can use Milton tablets or we use Purisol, which is a very similar product that basically you run through the tank uh, to ensure that it kills bacteria and sterilizes everything in there so that you can use it um, to store drinking water. Um, above that you've got your main control panel diesel heater um, and relevant buttons here. They're all fully explained in our Camper King guides so if you want more information on that then head over to our YouTube Camper King guides for full explanation on how all of that works. Welcome to another Camper King guide. In this guide, we're going to show you how the Camper King power management system works and to show you around our new Sargent EC176 PMS. Looking in the back cupboard, you'll see the PMS system. There's the main split charge on off, and this illuminates green when charging from 240 volt connection. There's a full shut off button to the left, which disengages everything that runs off the system if required. The fuse boards are all neatly tucked away and they are the fuses for all your appliances in the conversion such as your sockets and lighting circuits. Close to your sergeant system will be the fuse for your fridge. In the picture you see it's on the left hand side. The middle one will be for your diesel heater if you have one fitted and the other one will be for the leisure battery itself and this includes a cutout between the leisure battery and the sergeant system. Our power management system is totally UK supplied and manufactured. So here we have the Camper King control panel and this operates all the functions of your power management system and also helps you monitor everything from your battery level to how much water you have on board. To turn the system on you need to use the top left standby button. Turn on the ambient lighting and the cupboard lighting using the top right and middle left buttons. 
These operate the LED spotlights that can be individually operated by tapping the metal outer rings. The water pump is operated using the button to the bottom left, so turn that on before operating your water tap. On the right hand side, the centre button allows you to scroll through to see how much fresh water you have in your tank, the voltage of your leisure battery and its charging status, the voltage of the vehicle battery and its health. So all these settings have LEDs red to green to help indicate their status. Ensure you are connected to the leisure battery. You can check this by using the right hand button to show leisure battery and the display will also say LBAT at the top left. The final button allows you to change the control panel settings such as time and date. When you're driving, the fridge and diesel heater will still work with the engine engaged, but the two 240 volt sockets will not work However, the two USB sockets still will operate. Here we have your power management system, your PMS. The top right button is your main on off switch for everything that connects to your leisure battery and turns your LED touch lights on. The button to the left of that is for your ambient lighting and internal cupboard lighting on all 2020 models. For any camper vans that are made before this, you've got a spare port on your leisure battery and you can connect devices to that. The one below is for your water pump. So anytime you want to use your sink, turn that on, lift your tap, and away you go. And then the three buttons on the left hand side, you've got the one at the bottom, which is for your water, and that indicates how much water you've got in your onboard water tank. The one in the middle shows you how much charge you've got on your leisure battery. And the one at the top shows you how much charge you've got on your main van battery. You'll also notice you have a G in the middle of your power management system and this indicates when your leisure battery is being charged by the vehicle itself whilst driving. So here we have your Wabasto diesel heater control unit. It's important to say we'd recommend to read your manual that you would have been issued when you collected your van prior to using and this is just a quick how-to um, in practice of how your unit works. So to wake up the unit, simply twist the wheel. And you'll notice on screen you've got three settings. First one on the left is your fan um, ventilation setting. So if we click that in, it's then got four levels that you can set it to. And this will stay on for as long as you leave it on. To go back, press the white standby at the top right it brings us back to the main menu. The middle option is your heating, so to turn that on push the dial in again and it then comes up with your temperature settings. So it goes up to 35 degrees and to turn it on again click the wheel in. You'll notice that the standby now goes green to show us that it's turned on and it, tip it typically takes two and a half minutes for your diesel heater to fully engage. At this point, you can click the wheel in again and it shows a figure of eight which shows you that the diesel heater will stay on continuously until you turn it back off. Or if you spin the wheel, you can choose a timer and select how long you want the diesel heater to stay on for. To turn it off, press the green standby and it then goes white to indicate that it's turned off. On the right hand side you've got your settings and you can refer to your manual for how all of these operations work and simply press the white to go back to your main menu. Here is your diesel heater outlet located underneath your driver's seat. So we're now going to take a look in the rear of the van starting off with the rear locker. In the rear locker, you've got a 16 amp fast charger, which is orange when turned on, and that will indicate that your leisure battery is being charged. You've got a breaker board, which is household grade, and leisure battery, which is tucked away underneath um, two boards, um, which uses a four gang fuse and includes spare fuses as well. If you've opted for solar, the panel and charger for that will be located in the back of here as well. 
For more information on any of the elements of this handover, please scan the QR code on your fuse box, which will take you to our YouTube channel, Camper King Guides. Below the rear cupboard, you've got your gas locker. For how to operate that and how it all works, head over to our YouTube channel, Camper King Guides, for full explanation. Today we're going to have a look at connecting up your gas to your rear gas locker in your camper van. To do that, we've got a 907 butane camping gas bottle. We're going to just undo the top thread so we can connect it up. Just pop it down here for a sec. Then you've got two catches. Just undo both of those on your gas locker. Like so. And then we can just tuck that out of the way for the time being. So you've got your regulator, which connects to the top of the gas bottle and then you've got a strap that secures the gas in place. So just move that out of the way so that we can drop it in once we've hooked it up. And we're going to connect the gas up on the outside because of space. It's quite, quite tight in there. Um, this is the easiest way to do it. So we're just going to put the regulator on the top with all gas, the threads the opposite way. And you can just twist the bottle on. Like so. That's in nice and securely. And then at a slight angle, lift your bottle up. It will just drop straight in. And then you can just move your hose out of the way. To turn the gas on and off is the threading at the top here. And it's anti-clockwise for on and clockwise to shut it back off again. And to secure the gas, you've got your strap just here. Once it's all hooked up and you're ready to go somewhere, just make sure that you turn the gas off and then we can put the gas cover back on. So to the rear of the vehicle, you've got your hookup point under here and water that we fill up from the outside. For full information on how these both work, head over to YouTube and Camper King Guides for an in-depth explanation on how to operate both of those. So today we're going to have a look at how to connect a hookup cable to your camper and how to fill up your onboard water tank. So next to the van here we've already got hookup cable set out ready to go. So just imagine on site you've got yourself set up all ready to go and have a nice weekend of camping. Your hookup cable you've got a male end and a female end. This end is the one that you'll connect to the site facility um, and plugs into the hookup cable there. And this is the end that connects to your van. So on the side of the van, you've got a black flap. That opens up. And then you also have a flap on top of your hookup cable. So all we do is lift that up, align it, and that top flap rests on the top. You can then just push in and connect up your hookup cable. To release it, you've got a little blue push down button so we push that down and you can then just pull the hookup cable away. Easy peasy. Doing the water. So we've already filled up the jerry can with some water here. You'll have two keys for your water. So all we're going to do is unlock that. So push to the left and that just pops off. You've got a 20 litre water tank. So the jerry can we're using here is 10 litres, so it'd be two of these to fill it to the brim. You can use your onboard PMS system to tell you how much water is in the tank at any given time. And if you overfill it, it will spill out over the wheel arch here. So we've connected that up. We're now just gonna fill up the water tank. Awesome. Pop that back in there. Twist this off. And then simply put the cap back on. So twist on to the right. Lock that off. And just give it a twist to make sure that it's moving freely to show us that it's locked. So outside of the van, to fill up your diesel and add blue just in here. For more information on that, Again, we have a video on our YouTube channel. 
In this video, we're talking ad blue. So we're going to be looking at where you fill up the ad blue tank and how to know when you need to fill up your ad blue. So starting off point, sat behind the wheel and looking at the dash. So we're going to turn the ignition on. We're in a T6.1, but in a T6, you will have the facility to go on and check status of the vehicle. So on the T6.1, you have a button on the right hand side that takes you to a number of different settings and controls. Once we've pressed the button on the right hand side of the steering wheel, it comes up with a few different options. We're gonna select driving data, click OK, and it comes up here telling you distance that you've covered, but if you press the up and down arrows, it shows you what your ad blue range is. Um, so we've currently got 2,500 miles left until it's empty. The tanks on the T6.1s are 13 litres, which will typically last you 6,000 miles of range. Um, like your fuel, the ad blue just shows up on the uh, dashboard anytime that you need to fill it up. So that's how to see when you need to fill up your ad blue. We're next going to look at how to fill up the tank itself. So we've got here our container of ad blue. The ad blue filling up point is just here. So open your passenger door first and it sits just below your diesel. To fill this up, just take the cap off. Pop that to one side for now. We're going to grab our ad blue, pop it in the end, and then just lift. And we can hear that going in. So it's advisable to check the level um, maybe every 30 seconds on the dash again, just so that you don't overfill your ad blue. Um, it's quite important you don't overfill it, so just make sure you monitor how much you've put in it at any one go. And then when you've finished, tilt it back up and then just pop the cap back on. Nice and simple. Here we have our Dometic Sunshade. For how to operate this, head over to YouTube and Camper King Guides. So today we're going to have a look at how to operate the Dometic PW1000 Sunshade, which is what we fit 99% of our camper vans with. So to start with, we're going to need our awning handle, which is stowed just behind your driver's seat. And there's a couple of clips that, that house this. So just take that off. <clears throat> this point, we have a hole just here on the left-hand side of the awning, which is where your awning handle goes into and then you can start to wind the sunshade out. So we typically advise to wind it out to around a meter, just so that you're not putting too much pressure on the arms of the sunshade. At this point, we can then drop the legs down. So to do that, one finger on the end, push the spring in, drop it towards you, and then you can slide it along on the rail and clip it in, lift the collar, and then there's another clip here. You can then just extend that all the way out, do it at an angle and lock it off. And exactly the same with this side. Push it in, slide it along on the rail, clip it in, lift the collar, and then just extend that all the way out and lock that off. We can now continue to wind out the sunshade until the arms are Pretty much straight so just carry on winding it out you might find that you need to adjust the legs ever so slightly so that's extended fully just a quick one if this does get stuck in here like this just push it up give it a twist and it'll just drop out like so and then we can just adjust the legs so that this is all squared off nicely like so. The reverse of this, exactly the same. So what we're going to do is just wind it into a meter. You feel a bit of tension to start with, but that's fine. So wind it into a meter. I'm just going to have to adjust these legs ever so slightly because we pulled them out when we were winding it out
that there is fine. So, in reverse, lift the collar, unclip, and then you've got a little black plastic section on the end that pushes down and allows for you to slide this along on the rail. That just goes in on the spring. Same with this side, so lift the collar, unclip, push to release, and then slide all the way to the middle and push it in on the spring like so. And then from here, we can just continue to wind it in until it is completely snug with the side of the casing. And just make sure it is quite tight so that this forms a, a, a good seal so that when you're driving along, it doesn't whistle or damage the sunshade. to another Camper King guide. In this guide, we're going to show you how to operate the Fiamma F45S wind-out sunshade, which is fitted to a number of our vehicles. So it's very, very straightforward. Inside the vehicle, you will find the wind-out awning arm. So this is a folding arm that you can use for the wind-out itself. And that's very simply has a hook on the end, which connects into the wind-out piece of the uh, Fiamma on the end here so you get those connected and then you can start to extend the awning extend the sunshade out and the thing to bear in mind here just to be aware of is you'll need your your sliding door shut at this point and best to have your passenger door shut as well and what you'll need to do is get this to a certain point as you can see the front of the awning is weighing the sunshade down so what we're going to do is take the legs out at this point and they just unclip from there and bring those down so you've got a bit of support for the awning at the front then and all there all we've got here is just like a little wing nut that will just tighten that off there so that is now supported so we can now come to the other leg, remove that and drop that down. And the same on this one, use the little wing nut just to release the leg and tighten that up. So now that's fully supported, we can continue winding it out until we're happy with where the position of it is. And obviously, as you move this forward, you're going to need to move the legs and extend the legs otherwise they start to slip away as you can see so we'll come back out again a bit further this time and obviously we're in the showroom at the moment so we haven't got the benefit of being able to peg these down but we'll get to a point where we're happy so we're at a stage now where we're almost fully extended so we'll go to about there and then we can take the legs up to the desired height and one tip here is especially if you're not in the particularly sunny climate is if you're going to get some rainfall the best thing to do is to leave some of this awning slightly sloping down at one side so your rainwater will run off so tightening one leg up so that it's ever so slightly shorter than the other allows the rain to fall off in one direction. So there we go. So that's it fully extended and out and you can obviously put your furniture out here. One thing to be aware of is if you open your passenger door, it will foul up against the awning supports unless you have the leg on this side fully extended. So that is just something to be aware of. And then of course, for returning the awning back to its cassette, all you need to be doing is reversing what you've just done. So again, you get your, your winder in the correct position and just reverse how you've gone. Watching those legs at the same time usually helps to have a second person 
on the legs just to make sure they can be moved at the appropriate moment. And start to shuffle those back in a bit. Once you get to about there, you can start to think about pulling those legs completely in now, back to where they were. So I'll do that. So again, just a reversal of what we've just done. Loosen the wing nut, bring that leg up. Tighten that off. And then it literally will just fold back in and clip in there. Same again here. Like so. And then we can finish winding that back in. So in order to be certain that your Fiamma F45 has retracted completely, keep an eye on this red tag just here. And you can see it's out at the moment. But once you've retracted it, that red tag moves in and vanishes. So that is one way to be certain that your Fiamma has been retracted. Job done. That's how to operate your Fiamma F45S wind out sunshade. So now over to your bed. Um, we fit two types of beds in our conversions, either a rock and roll bed or a rib. To operate both of those, we've got videos um, that show you how to do so. Again, YouTube, Camping Guides, and that will give you a full description on how to operate either of those beds. In this video, we're going to show you how to operate your gas-assisted rock and roll bed. So to begin with, we're going to kneel in front of the bed. You've got your release catch here, which we're going to use flat palm to push down to release the bed. At this point, you can put one hand down the back of the foam and start to bring it out towards you. Before you bring it out too far, it's worthwhile releasing tension on the seat belts just to make sure you don't get any resistance as you pull the bed out. Hand back down the foam and you'll be able to get it so far and far enough for the gas strut to allow you. And it's at this point where we want to get over the top of the bed, being mindful not to put any weight on the front as doing so might cause damage to the floor and can scuff it. Um, so it's literally just pulling it out all the way this far and then we're going to lock it in place. So get to the spine of the bed, no weight on the front, push it down and lock it in place. If you are a little bit shorter and struggle to do it this way, you can stand on the inside of the sliding door step like so. The bed's all the way out and again putting no weight on the front of the bed, get to the spine of it push down and lock in place. The reverse of that, to get the bed back up, it's the same lever, use your palm again, push and hold, the gas strut will start to squeeze the bed back together. At this point, we can come down onto two knees, push it down and lock it in place. And that is how you operate your gas assisted rock and roll bed. Welcome to another Camper King Guide video and in this video we're going to show you how to operate the Camper King rear upgraded bed. This bed is available as standard in our Santorini, Le Mans and Portofino models and it's available as an upgrade in both Saint Tropez and Monte Carlo. With your bed in the upright position first thing you need to do is remove the headrests so these literally just slide out top like so, and then you just need to stow those away so they're out of the way, nice and simple. Then make sure you've got the grab handle and that is unimpeded, it's not tucked down the back or anything like that. Take hold of that. Underneath the front of the seat is a sprung bar which you just need to release and then 
keeping hold of that and allow the bed to lower itself down. Keeping hold of the grab handle just so it doesn't drop away from you. There you go. And then just making sure that the, the seat belt buckles don't foul the upholstery in any way. And then once that's down, you can make sure they're tucked out the way for comfort before you set up any of your bedding. At the rear of the vehicle, you need to drop the rear panel of the bed down to a level position. So you do that by lifting the flap and then releasing the handle just there and the bed will drop down. You need to keep hold of the handle so that it goes through the various ratcheting positions but once you're happy with the position of that rear panel then you're done. If you've not already lifted that, that can be stowed like that during transit if you want it to be. You can have kit stored both underneath and on top of this while you're driving along or you can have that raised during your driving if you so wish. In order to restore the seat to its original upright position, all you need to do with the rear panel is just to lift that back up and it goes through the various ratchet positions until it reaches the last position. You can then just let go of that. And when you're back inside the vehicle, all you need to do is take hold of the grab handle and then you just give that a pull until the bed, the bed goes up into the first position. You can then let go and come back to your sprung bar at the front, give that a pull and tuck the bed the rest of the way back and then just make sure that you readjust your seat belts and then everything's back the way it was. In this video we're going to have a look at how to operate your rib bed. So the rib bed folds out in three parts, it's on a rail system that allows you to move the bed forwards and backwards and we'll, we'll need to do that as we, as we unfold the bed. So the starting off point is a handle on the right hand side here, lift that up and put your other hand down the back of the foam of the seat which allows you to flip the bed over. Anytime you let go of that handle it locks in place. So keep the handle lifted till you get it in position and we want it horizontal like so. At this point we're going to bring the bed so it's flush with the, these units here and to do that we need to lift this bar and bring the bed towards us. Next step is dropping this. So you can now at this point kneel on the first cushion. There's another bar here that we're gonna lift and it allows for this to drop down, like so. Then the last bit is the same as the first bit. You've got a handle just there and we're gonna use this strap to push the cushion down and lower it down. So push down, same as that one. If you let go, it locks in place. So you can use that as like a lounger, push that until it's horizontal and that is the bed completely down. <clears throat> in reverse, again, you want to use this grab handle here, push that there. You don't want it so it's completely vertical. You want a slight angle on it so it allows for this to lock in. Two hands at the top of the seat belt brackets, lift that up and you've just heard that lock in place. Back to this bar here, we're going to lift that up and just push the bed away from you. And the last thing is flipping this back over. So one hand over here and drop that down like so. And that is operating your rib bed. So up here we've got your elevating platform bed and your pop top roof. Again, for best practice and how to operate those, head over to YouTube and Camping King Guides on how to do so. So today we're gonna to look at how to pull down and secure your pop top roof. Important thing to mention at this point, you've got three windows on your pop top. Make sure that all of those are zipped up and secured firstly, just to avoid any damage to the material zips and the poppers. So when you're bringing your roof down, always make sure that you're facing the back and it's done in two parts. So we wanna start off by bringing the elevating platform bed down first. And you'll notice that it's on gas struts. So all we're gonna do is two hands, just bring bed platform down first. So we've got the bed platform down. At this point, we wanna bring the rest of the pop top down. And to do that, you've got your two grab handles. If you're slightly taller, you can just grab directly onto the plastic and for the slightly shorter people like myself, you've got the nylon straps that you can use to bring the roof down with. 
Um, it's quite important to ensure that you don't yank or pull, you keep your back and your arms straight and that you just use your body weight to bring the roof down. And the main technique is to literally just use your body weight and bring your bum down to the back of your feet, which is what we're gonna do now. So grabbing onto the grab handles, lower yourself down, arms nice and straight and bum down towards the back of your feet. So with the roof secured down, we've now got the two straps at the front that we use to secure the roof in place. And we're just gonna look at these a little bit closer. So these straps go through the two top brackets and double loop through. Main reason being is that without it, they'll fall off the top clasp and I'll show you that in a second. Um, and it also allows you to get a good amount of tension when you're securing the roof. These are the only things that will secure your roof and stop it flying open at 60 miles an hour down the motorway. Um, so make sure that these are inside your glove box or tucked somewhere out the way, out the reach of kids, because um, without them you can't drive off. So um, all that we're gonna do is, with the buckle facing this way, feed through the end of the strap and feed it back through like so. If you don't double loop it, it will just fall off. So make sure We want to feed it through the top bracket, underneath, and then double loop it back through again. At this point, you can then feed it through the bottom bracket, squeeze the clasp open, and feed it back through like so. If we just do that loosely for the time being, that will allow us to pull all of the material in and ensure that none of it is hanging outside of your pop top. And before you drive off, make sure you go around the outside of your van and check that there's no material hanging outside of the pop top roof. Um, it stops you causing any damage to it and just ensures that you've got a nice tight seal the whole way around. When you're happy, we can then get the second strap attached exactly the same as the first one through the top bracket through and then double it through for a second time down through the bottom bracket squeeze the clasp and feed it back through at this point you can get a bit of tension on it and you want to do it so that you can give it a bit of a twang and feel that there's a good amount of tension behind it. Just tuck that out of the way and then exactly the same with that one there and tuck that out of the way. So we hope that filled in a few gaps on how to operate and use your camper van. And from all of us here, we hope you create many happy memories in your new camper. If you do need any help or support at any point, you can contact our service department via our service at Camper King mailbox or contact them on 01295 237 920. Also worthwhile mentioning our Club Camper King Owners Club, which you can join via our Facebook page for loads of really useful hints and tips on how to get the most out of your camper van.